Okay. So since morning, we have been looking at three components, right? So the first component was the data science piece. So I was kind of giving you a process-based approach to structure data science pipelines, giving you the various aspects on what all you would think about when you're putting together data science applications. We looked at a case study on how you can structure a whole NLP application and what are the key things which you'll have to think about when you're structuring NLP applications. In the second presentation, uh, Gustavo walked us through how do you structure time series problems. And we went deep dive. So I wanted to kind of pick and choose different themes so that you get an idea on what you're going to see in the whole certification program. Uh, the, the pieces he talked about were like, kind of going ground up and understanding the core aspects you need to understand when you're putting together a type series problem. And uh, how do you rigorously test what aspects are there in the type series problem and then appropriately model it. Right. The third aspect, which Anish talked about, was looking at optimization problems. Right. How do you take uh, optimization as a theme? How do you mathematically represent it? What are the key ideas in Matrosia and optimization? How do you put together various applications? And then we saw a couple of quick demos on some of the tooling you could potentially use for optimization. In this segment, I want to connect some of the dots and uh, talk primarily in the context of machine learning because that's kind of the rage nowadays, right? Everybody wants to build machine learning applications. And uh, I will give you a case study on building a whole you know, machine learning problem using a publicly available data set. And some of you have already seen this problem, so you'll either reinforce your knowledge or you'll kind of you know, tune it out if you want to see this. Um, so let me first uh, talk about, uh, I think I showed this slide in the morning too. So everybody is hiring you know, AI fonts and data scientists, experts nowadays. So what do people talk about when you talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, right? Um, we are not always trying to build machines which will replace humans. Many a times we want machines to do what they're really good at. And what machines are good at is identifying patterns. And if you have seen different patterns, a lot of times, you know, it will be good at it, right? Because you can mathematically represent it and if the mathematics works out, it's going to say identify the pattern, right? Um, so when you're talking about AI and machine learning, sometimes these terms are used interchangeably. Uh, but you have to think about which problems are machine learning problems, which problems are just robotic process automation problems, and which problems are artificial intelligence problems. Because if you're just talking about making things go faster, taking some problem and basically scaling it so that you can run it hundreds and thousands of times, which would have taken you like maybe, you know, uh, what would take you hours will only take a couple of seconds, it's just process automation. You're not really building in much intelligence on that, right? So I would recommend you to read this report where they talk about, you know, how are the key themes differentiated? I thought this was a nice uh, pictorial representation to kind of look at um, artificial intelligence as a category and then big data analytics as another category, then machine learning being some kind of a subcategory of this broader category of artificial intelligence. And in this category of machine learning, you have supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And uh, you also have deep learning, which is a methodology of structuring machine learning problems and using some of these techniques like supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning to make uh, you know, different kinds of neural networks to do these deep learning problems. So um, I would also recommend you to look at this McKinsey report, which is uh, has like an executive guide to AI, in case you are really new with AI and machine learning, kind of gives you some terminologies and key ideas you want to think about when you're structuring these kinds of applications. Okay, so uh, one of the things you need to understand is how is machine learning different from traditional statistics, right? So statisticians in the past, the key goal for them was, uh, well, we do not have a lot of data, so we have to think about a sampling strategy so that we can get a sample which represents the population, 
And now that I have a sample, I want to understand the characteristics of the sample. And in order to understand the characteristics of the sample, I'm going to build a model. And hopefully this model is going to represent the population. And I'm going to use this model as a proxy for the population. Right? In the context of machine learning, we have tons and tons of data. And we're thinking about machinery which could be used to learn from this data and either build parametric or non-parametric models, which will basically learn the nuances in this data. And we could use that to build out a model which could be used for predictions or for forecasting and things, applications like that. So, um, you know, a lot of surveys nowadays are talking about deep learning and reinforcement learning, but we also have like the traditional methodologies like, you know, regression and random forest and things like that. So, um, one of the key things to understand, you know, how quants are kind of using some of their skills and how they are migrating those skills or augmenting those skills with newer methodologies. Uh, if you had gone to grad school in mathematical finance or, you know, uh, financial engineering, even five to 10 years ago, predominantly these would be like the themes you would be learning. But many of the skills which I kind of talked about in the first slide, you know, when JP Morgan says they are hiring their data scientist quants or, you know, uh, Golden Sachs is hiring their data scientist quants, they are looking for skills on this side of the equation, which is, you know, knowledge of natural language processing, machine learning, predictive analytics, deep learning, sentiment analysis, leveraging alternative data. All these are key themes which a quant has to know. They're building out these kind of applications. Right. So let's, uh, I know someone in the morning had a question about how do you think about you know, structuring these business problems, right? And one of the key ideas I presented in the morning was uh, you have to think about what problem are you trying to solve. And you could kind of even take this problem and put this in, uh, in the context of uh, why are we doing it? And in some ways you have the supply factors because you have a lot of technology and uh, you know, there's a lot of data available so you can potentially leverage those. Uh, but also on the other hand, there are demand factors. Uh, there is profitability constraints, there's competition, there's an arms race for speed, and there's also some regulations coming in. Right? So um, the goal is, you know, if you are looking at you know, the various use cases, I think there was another question on, you know, what kind of <coughs> use cases are out there. You can see that machine learning has a lot of interesting use cases. And finance is just one of them. Right? Uh, but the nuances in finance are different because, you know, we are working with data which is very difficult to predict. It's very noisy. Uh, there are privacy concerns. So you have to factor all those constraints when you're building applications. Okay. So before I start out by you know, telling you about machine learning, I have a, an exercise for you. Uh, so let's go back to the, the research hub. And at the end, I have a link for you called as the credit risk app. So let's start there. So if you click on that, you're gonna see an application which looks like this. Okay. So let's start there. So here, what we are trying to do is, is predict interest rates given a bunch of different parameters. Okay, so this is the case study, what we're going to be building uh, as a part of this exercise. So here, I'm going to be you know, inputting multiple parameters. So uh, this is uh, a data set from the lending club data. So I'll talk about the data set in a minute, but let's just fill out this form and see how the application works. So I am looking for a $35,000 uh, loan. I'm going to pay it back in five years. And uh, I'm, you know, using an installment of, let's say, $2,000. These are different kinds of grades of loans. We'll talk about it in a little bit. And then, uh, you know, I've been employed 10 plus years. I own a house. I don't make much. Um, source verified. And then purpose, I'm going to do some home improvement. And I live in uh, Massachusetts. Step to income ratio 10. Hello, you have a question? Um, does the subgrade have to match the grade? 
Uh, yes, happening. yes, um, you're right, you're right. You're right, uh, that constraint hasn't been put in here, but you have, you're right, that has to make sure. Yeah, you're right, thank you. Uh, past due instances, one, inquiries in the past six months, one, previous loan status approved. Now comes the question, which algorithm I'm going to be using? So this is all the information I'm collecting from a user. So if a user has provided all this information, I want to predict what interest rate would this person get, loan it. So we have built three models. One is a random forest model, a neural network model, and a linear regression model. And we'll talk about all these models as we go. Uh, but the point here is, it's a machine learning model, right? There is no decision maker at the end. In the past, what used to happen is given this information, someone would look at this information and make a decision. You know, even uh, when, the, you know, if, uh, when I uh, bought, uh, bought my home, my mortgage broker basically said, I have all these lookup tables. Given all this information, I go to this lookup table, so I go in here and say, oh, this is your FICO score. Oh, this is the amount of loan you're requesting. This is the term of the loan. And he would go through this lookup table and then get to a box and say, you are eligible for this loan and these are going to be the terms of the loan based on all these criteria. So someone had put together that lookup table. Basically it was gut feel or fundamental analysis or something had been done to basically put together that lookup table and every day in the morning, the broker would get a new copy of this lookup table, right? Lending club is an alternative lending place. It's not a traditional financial institution. In the past, if you wanted to get a loan, you would go to a bank. And if you did not know the bank well, most likely you would not get a loan. I mean, um, I got rejected with my student loan back in India uh, because uh, I saw, I was like just riding my uh, two-wheeler and uh, I wanted to go to um, my um, undergrad uh, engineering school. Um, I got an admission already and I wanted to get a loan. So I was driving and I saw this big banner ad that said, student loans, walk in. And then I stopped my two wheeler, walked in, went directly to the bank manager's office. I said, I'm a student, I would like to get a loan. I've got an admission, what do I want? And this uh, bank manager looked at me he asked, do you have an account? So, no, I'm still in my teens. I don't have an account yet. And he said, your parents have an account with us? No. Then do you have any collateral? I have a two-wheeler. <laughs> and then uh, they said, sorry, we can't give you a loan. And they sent me out. And then I went back and I told my parents and then they told me like, that's not easy. You, know, you need to have the relationships and they call their you know, banker of choice, and then they finally, you know, made all the connections happen, and then they said, okay, you're, you're gonna get a loan, and we're gonna put the house as a collateral, you know, because uh, everything requires a collateral. They put the house as a collateral, and I was given my student loan. Um, the point being, in the past, you either had to have collateral or connections to get loans. And now, you know, when we get a credit card, we are being constantly monitored of our, our spending patterns because the bank is giving us loans every time we make the purchase of the cafe latte or whatever we buy at Starbucks. We are basically taking small loans and we're making those purchases. Right? So companies like Lighting Club are the newer business models. These are the fintech companies of today, right? Prosper, Lending Club. These are companies where there is no traditional bank backing them up. It's a peer-to-peer -peer lending phase, which means that if I have money and I don't want my bank to give me 0.5% as a monthly interest rate, what's my other alternative? Going to the stock market. Well, the stock markets are very risky. What in case I want 6% or 8%? So I could potentially go into lending club and lend it to someone. And people come in here and they get requisition loans. It could be debt consolidation. So look at all the choices in here. So buying a car, credit card, debt consolidation, home improvement, 
<coughs> medical, moving, renewable energy, small business, vacation, wedding. So all these are purposes by which like, you know, people are going and just filling an application saying, hey, I'm getting married, I need $10,000, can someone lend it to me? And these are my criteria. You know, I'm employed, I own a house, um, you know, this is my debt to income ratio, can someone lend it to me? Most likely, they'll get funded by someone or a bunch of people, and the terms of the loan will be set by someone. Right? They'll basically say, I can give it to you for 18%. But 25%, you want to buy a board? Well, it's pretty risky, 25% interest. And would you want to borrow it from us? Okay. And the goal there is they are kind of taking care of their risk. And they may have a portfolio of other loans, and they are factoring in the potential default. And they're saying, well, if I'm taking so much risk without much collateral, this is the amount of interest I'm going to be requesting. So here, with this, what Lending Club has done is, they've just given us millions of loan transactions for various places in the United States, for various purposes, for various people with different kinds of lending profiles. And they have just said, these are the loans, and this is what the interest rates at which they were funded, and uh, you can use the data for to do whatever you want. And you could potentially build a machine learning model using that information. And it gives you a perspective. It may not give you your next interest rate, but it gives you a pretty decent estimate on the expected interest rate given a bunch of criteria, right? So here I am trying to use different models. Each one of these models are independent, independently trained. So different factors came into perspective when we did that. So when I presented this information, uh, neural network said that I'm going to potentially get it at 8.87%. Linear regression said that I may have to get, you know, I could potentially get it at 10.3%. And uh, random forest, which is an ensemble model, said I may potentially get it at 8.87%. So I have a rough estimate on the interest rate I could potentially expect, you know, to pay if I am borrowing money on Lending Club. This is based on past data on this website. Right. Now, uh, use cases, like why would someone even build a, an application like this? Right. Uh, as a investor, let's say I have a portfolio and I'm thinking, you know what, it's $100,000. I don't want to you know, put it in a bank and get like 0.5%. I would like to lend it to many people and get an estimated 5% or 10% interest rate. So I'm going to have a portfolio of loans and I'm going to fund people. Like someone like Anish, like I would say, like, oh, this guy is getting married, okay, $10,000. This guy wants to buy a board, another $10,000. So you kind of, you know, give it to them and hope that they're going to pay you back at 10%. But without information, Anish would never do that because he's an optimization guy. He's optimizing on his profits, right? So what would he do? So he'll build a machine learning application and he'll basically figure out potentially what interest rates people have gotten in the past so that you can requisition those interest rates. And if people agree to paying those interest rates, you're at least sure that you're in the ballpark of what you can potentially expect from a risk reward perspective. Right? On the other hand, there are financial institutions who are actually lending money to the lending club. You know, if you're a bank or if you're, you know, I spoke to someone uh, last year I gave uh, a talk about this particular application at the Open Data Science Conference in San Francisco. And uh, in the networking session, I met someone who works for an insurance company. And this insurance company are in the business of asset liability management, right? So they get assets through our premiums. We pay on a monthly basis. And then they have the liabilities. So I rent someone, I had to pay, you know, my car and the other person's car. But to match those assets and liabilities, they have to make investments so that they can match those potential you know, cash flows which are going to happen in the future. Right? So they have some discretion on what all they can potentially invest in. And I was surprised when they said like they have done extensive analysis to take a portion of those assets to invest in lending funds or other, other companies, because their perspective is, 
not just the return aspects of it. It is the risk, the, the after factoring the risk of lending cloud, they are figuring out that some of these investments are much safer than traditional assets, like stocks or bonds or other assets. So they've done that level of analysis. And the other aspect they're thinking about is, <clears throat> they had a whole study to figure out whether there are arbitrage opportunities, you know, wherein they could potentially borrow money from somewhere else at a lower interest rate and loan money at a higher interest rate on lending club and actually make much more money than what they're actually getting. That, that, that's kind of their perspective. So there are all these interesting problems you should never think about when you're just looking at data. But these are the kinds of problems which many fintech companies are working on. So here, the goal is to build out an application. So we'll kind of go back on the technical side on how do we actually structure this application, but I just wanted you to have the perspective that in finance, it's not always about just taking data and figuring out whether the stocks will go up or down. There are all these other interesting opportunities which we potentially leverage. Okay, so let's uh, kind of go back into structuring these problems. So here, as we have kind of discussed today, there are different kinds of data sets. You know, Gustavo talked about longitudinal and time series data sets. Uh, we have talked about in the morning some of the cross-sectional data sets which are out there. Um, the data could be numerical or categorical. So there are a lot of interesting applications. So I told you a little bit about goals in the morning, right? So I want to extend upon that. If your goal could be just descriptive statistics. Your goal could be just trying to understand what kind of data do I have? How do I summarize my numerical data? How do I summarize my categorical data? How do I kind of build together like a pivot table which has like numerical and categorical data built together? Right? Or it could be in the context of segmentation. I'm trying to segment my objects into different classes. Anish was mentioning clustering. So I want to be able to like bucket into different buckets. Or it could be prediction. So in this case, I'm trying to predict the interest rate at which someone's going to be borrowing money, right? So in order to structure these problems, there are a lot of interesting machine learning algorithms which are out there, right? So you could potentially look at algorithms <coughs> like regression, neural networks, KNN, decision trees, random forests. All these are algorithms which could potentially use, be used for prediction, right? On the other hand, if you're just trying to do segmentation, you could think about algorithms like k-means or hierarchical clustering or association rule mining. There are a lot of interesting algorithms <clears throat> when your goal is to look at some supervised learning activities. Okay, so my goal now is to structure this pipeline. And um, I want to kind of start out with data cleansing. Now I'm going to be getting a bunch of data processing and doing some feature engineering with that data. In the context of machine learning, you, know, you were asking me earlier, like, you know, can I just do interpolation versus extrapolation? So you have to think about a methodology by which I build a model, which not only works for my training data, but also works pretty good for the testing data. And the testing data basically means the data I'm keeping aside and the model or the model building process has never seen this testing data. And now you're building a model and saying, well, if I had applied this model to this data, which I kept aside, what will be my predictions and how close or far away from my predictions will I be, right? And then the context of model building, what do I use to build my models? Parametric models, non-parametric models, and then tune those models and then thinking about like, how do I select the best possible model that can be used for deep learning, right? So all these are things which you'll have to factor in. Now, um, I, told, I told a little bit about evaluation metrics in the morning. Typically what people do is decide, you know, what metric should they be optimizing on? Should I be minimizing my error rate should I be getting the maximum R squared value? Should I be minimizing the mean absolute percentage error? And 
that basically tells you what metric you're aiming for and how do you get the best possible models based on the metric you have identified as the metric you're optimizing on. If you're talking about classification, there are other metrics. The metrics like confusion matrix, ROC curves, etc. But for today's masterclass, we'll just focus on the prediction application. Okay, so once you have these goals and you have you know chosen a particular evaluation metric, you have to figure out like, well, what kind of a problem am I having? How do I actually choose a particular algorithm? And I told you that there are some frameworks you could potentially use to select different algorithms. But at this point, you're still choosing algorithms. You're not selecting an algorithm. You're basically choosing like a potential set of candidates which could potentially be deployed once you figure out the best performing model. Um, so before I get into the, the challenges, I, I'll talk about these challenges in a, in a second. Um, I would like to show a little bit about the case study so that we get to the case study and then the, uh, we'll kind of uh, you know, go back and look at some challenges. Um, so you can just go to the Kaggle website and get a sample of the data too. So if you're just wanting to play with the data, you can go to Kaggle and search for the Lightning Club data and you get a sample data set. I think there are like 10,000 rows. Uh, so you don't have to download the entire you know, 150 megabytes of data or whatever it is. Um, so typically your data is gonna look something like this. You know, what Gustavo was saying, you know, you have cross-sectional data sets where you have each record, you know, being uniquely identified by some kind of a record by a person's ID, and then you have characteristics for that particular person. What is opinion? I'm sorry? What is the opinion column? Um, so this is just a sample. I'll show you the real columns in here. So these are the, like the real columns which are out there. Um, so this is uh, the address state, annual income, delinquencies in the last two years, debt to income ratio, employee length, employment length, funded amount, funded amount, <coughs> invested, the grade of the loan, home ownership, inquiries in the last six months, installment, interest rate, um, the month in which the, uh, the issue date, uh, the loan amount, loan status, the purpose of the loan, the subgrade of the loan, the term of the loan and the verification status. So these are the parameters which uh, Lending Club has collected for each loan record. So um, to give you an idea on how to structure this problem, we have to identify a bunch of parameters which are gonna influence our decision, right? So those are what are called as features. So what features do I need to make a decision whether to give a loan or not? Well, that's a different problem. It's a classification problem, whether to give a loan or not. But in this particular case, if I give a loan, what will be the interest at which I'll be giving the loan, right? So in the context of what we are talking about, you could structure the same problem as a classification problem, if the decision is to give a loan or not, or to give, you know, if uh, it's a numerical problem, then I'm predicting at what interest rate I'm gonna be giving the loan, right? Okay, so there are different kinds of models you can potentially use. Uh, some are what are called as parametric models, and in this particular case, uh, you know, just chosen a couple of examples. Uh, linear regression is a framework, and many of you know that uh, you, know, you could represent, I just have one variable, I'm using my one, uh, one x variable and one y variable. You could use a very simple linear regression if the data looks linear. And the goal is to come up with these parameters. The model is learning the beta zero and beta one, which are the parameters. What are, the two, what are the two variables you're looking at? So the variable is given x1, can I predict y? Given x1. You don't need for the, for the axes. Oh, this could be any axis. This is okay. just, just so a, not an actual variable. This is not an actual okay. one. So this is just, uh, this is a sample to illustrate the concept. Uh, given x1, can I model y? And the goal is to come up with the best possible line which fits through this cloud of points. And the only two things I need to know is the slope and the intercept, right? And the slope is represented by this beta one, 
and the intercept is represented by beta zero, right? So if I uncover or if I have a model, I can structure this as an optimization problem. So if I'm structuring this as an optimization problem, I'll use ordinary least squares kind of a thing. So each one of these would be my error. So this would be my y hat, and this would be my y. y minus y hat is the error, right? And I'll have y minus y hat, which is another error, another error, another error. I have errors all over the place. And I just can't like add up all the errors. So I'm going to square these errors. And I'm going to ask the question, give me beta 0 and beta 1, which minimizes the sum of the squared errors. So if I call this as epsilon, give me the sigma epsilon i square minimize the sigma epsilon i square and tell me what is the best beta zero and beta one I can call. Right? So that's my equation in terms of machine learning. And we can generalize this in the context of neural networks. So instead of just allowing the degrees of freedom to be restricted to just one axis, I could potentially say, hey, I can give you multiple nodes, multiple layers, multiple activation functions, and what that will lead, will lead me to is, I could potentially look at the interactions of different variables. So what is the combination of x1 and x2, x1, x2, x3, et cetera, et cetera. But then I can also factor in non-linearities. If I have activation functions which factor non-linearities. So this gives me a generic framework. It will still give me a parametric model, but a generic framework to be able to come up with the best possible model. So uh, given that, what I could potentially do uh, is also look at some non-parametric models. And in the context of non-parametric models, uh, Nanish was mentioning K and N, right? So that's basically K nearest neighbors, right? So you know, uh, you're known by the friends you keep kind of a thing, right? So if you are in you know, the surrounding friends are all red, then you are potentially red. If you are surrounded by people who are blue squares, then you're potentially blue, right? Um, so the point here is mathematically, you're trying to figure out, you know, what should I be tagging this object as? So I look at the pairwise distance for the K variables. So K could be two in this particular case. So who are my two closest neighbors? Mathematically, these are two, my, my two closest neighbors. So I could tag this one as a threat because they are my two closest neighbors. Right? So it's a KNN algorithm. Or I could have decision trees wherein I could recursively partition my feature space and then say, you know what, if, my, if you own a home, then use this tree. If I rent a home, then use this tree. If uh, you're buying a car, use this tree. If I'm getting married, then buy this, you know, goods. So depending on your objective, you could potentially set up. You don't manually do the decision making. You let the algorithm decide the splits and the potential. So typically when you are looking at the workflow, you have to factor in all these aspects. Thinking starting from data, feature engineering, training, testing, building a model, selection and deployment. Let's uh, take a look at it on how we actually do it. And uh, then I'll regroup and we'll talk about um, the challenges and also aspects of what are left. Okay, so uh, in order to work on this problem, uh, what we have done is, I'll, I'll just kind of show you a demo uh, to give you a picture on how this is gonna look. Um, do we have the crash course running? If it's not running, I'll start one. Yes. Yes now. Start starting? Yes now. Start running? Uh, which project? Are you yeah. CVS short course? Yeah. Uh, no, not CVS short course. Crash course. Crash. I don't think uh, it's you need to start one. Okay, so we'll start one. Okay, so 
So what's happening is uh, we are basically orchestrating this process on Amazon, and it's going to start up the whole experiment. So when uh, while this is going on, we'll talk a little bit about the challenges, and hopefully the experiment will have uh, fired up, and I'll kind of walk you through the, uh, the key aspects of the, the experiment. Okay. So one of the key things to notice, um, it's not as simple as I made it look like this. I just basically putting together a workflow and saying, you do this and then do this and then do this. Because most problems don't come with a label saying that, well, I'm a classification problem. Or the data doesn't come saying, you know, oh, hey, I'm a regression problem. So I've, our model, which is the best possible model, you just need to uncover that model, right? Uh, so you have to start tagging, like, what kind of a problem it is in the first place, right? And at times, machine learning may not be the best solution for the problem you have, right? And that's why, you know, we are kind of illustrating various themes in this workshop. You know, we're looking at optimization problems, we're looking at time series based problems, because there are different, you know, flavors of data science problems. And uh, in the context of machine learning, uh, you may also have to think about whether the algorithm is going to meet challenges you have in the data set. For example, so if you're trying to do anomaly detection, right? Anomaly detection is a problem wherein 99.9% .9 of the times you're going to have data of one class. 0.01% of the times you're going to have data of another class, right? So if you're trying to use a machine learning algorithm without considering that you have an imbalanced data set, what will the machine learning algorithm do? It will try to, based on the metric you're trying to decide, maybe let's say we are trying to figure out accuracy as the basis for selecting a model. So I'm going to come up with a black box model, and this black box model will say, tag all these data points you're going to get as not anomalous. So these are good data points. So irrespective of the data label, I'm just going to tag every data point as not anonymous. Um, so what will the accuracy be? 99.9%, right? I'll miss out on the anomalous data points, which are 0.01%, right? If a machine learning algorithm is given the same kind of thing, if it's optimizing an accuracy, then it will basically tune itself, and you'll get a pretty good number in terms of accuracy, but for the class, which is of concern and importance, you'll get really terrible results, 100% errors for the anonymous data points. So you have to use techniques to make sure that um, you don't uh, you know, have an algorithm learn one class just because it is being seeing so many of those data points. There are techniques in order to address that, but uh, the point here is you have to have some intelligent way of addressing this particular challenge. Uh, the second thing is uh, you have to think that whatever you are building has to be generalizable enough so that you can deploy it into production. Just because it worked on a very small data set doesn't mean that it's going to work in all potential use cases. So you have to figure out, well, um, am I handling bias properly? Am I overfitting to my data? So historically, if it has worked, can I generalize it enough and can I do enough cross-validation? Can I test it for various scenarios so that I can make sure that the model actually works when I'm using it? <laughs> A lot of people have talked about, you know, they having you know, really good success in proof of concepts, but when it goes into production, things go haywire. And that's the reason why in the morning I mentioned the 11 bullet point, you need to have a good monitoring framework in order to understand how these models actually can be performing in the future. Okay, so uh, another key aspect which a lot of people are now emphasizing is uh, this notion of interpretability and auditability of models. Uh, now that we are moving very fast into the neural networks era, uh, a lot of concerns are being raised. That it's not just that we are seeing good results, but we don't know how these algorithms are actually working. So uh, there was a paper which said that you know, even with minor changes in uh, the network, the algorithm is going to tag the same picture uh, in a completely different classification category. So you have to make sure that uh, 
if there are use cases wherein you have to be able to go and look at what the model is actually doing, you have to choose interpretable models. Uh, but also, you know, things like transparency are becoming more and more important. And that's the reason why many of these open source projects are gaining prominence because you can actually go under the hood and see what these algorithms are doing. And it gives you that level of comfort that you know, you're understanding what you're actually implementing. And then I told you about the various metric choices you have. Um, doesn't mean that you choose the metric which works best for you. As a data scientist, you want to prove that your model works the best. If you choose a metric which works really good, but it doesn't really match the ultimate goal of deployment, then you are optimizing in the wrong metric. So you need to make sure that you choose the right metrics when you are building out these solutions. And um, the other aspect is uh, we are not there yet. I mean, many a times we feel like well, we have enough technology, we have enough data, we have all the algorithms, we just build out an algorithm and you know, we can just sit back and relax. We're not there yet. Uh, there's a lot of analysis and thought process involved in designing deployment algorithms, and we have to make sure that we factor that in. And that's where you know, we come in this picture. So we have to have enough skills to understand what's actually working and what doesn't work. Okay, so that was um, you know, a couple of things to ponder about when we are kind of building out models. So let me show you a couple of things in the way this application has been built. Uh, so what I'm gonna do now is uh, show you the entire case study in Python, just to give you an idea of how we can actually structure this application. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is exploring this data set. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, if I look at the data, uh, so this is the data set we got. So you have the loan amount, term, interest, uh, interest rate, installment, grade, subgrade, et cetera, et cetera. So this was the data which we have used to build out this model. Now, when we kind of look at uh, you know, exploration in the context of uh, Python, you could use Jupyter Notebook. And here we are looking at a specific time snapshot, August 2011 to December 2011. Uh, so I mentioned that these are the various variables we are using for this model. And we can look at individual parameters on the kinds of you know, data sets you are having. Uh, a good way to understand and explore the data is looking at some distribution plots. Uh, we can see like the different kinds of features we have in here. Since we have numerical data, we could also potentially look at things like correlation matrices to see if there are variables which are highly correlated, right? Um, and then you could also look at some of the categorical features and there you may have to do some massaging, so you could potentially take some of these variables like A, B, C and master them into numbers. Uh, another way is to use what's called as one-hot encoding uh, to potentially you know, transform these numerical categorical variables into numerical variables. Um, and then you could summarize some of these data sets. So these are the number of categories we have in each one of these different classes. These are all the categorical variables, these are the different categories. And then you can also look at some of the numerical variable um, metrics. So for example, for the loan amount, uh, the average loan amount was $12,861 with a standard deviation of $8,500. The minimum loan people have requested is $1,000. The maximum loan was $35,000. Okay. Um, so you can look at each one of these parameters and kind of get a, get a feel for it. Um, on an average inquiries in the last month, you know, the average was 0.84 with a standard deviation of one. Obviously minimum is no inquiries. Maximum was eight inquiries. This person really needs a loan, right? Um, so you can also look at like, you know, annual income, some people having really high incomes and some people have, having really low incomes. So if you're a company like this insurance company I was talking about, right? 
So they could potentially look at this data set and you know, they would say, you know what, I have a target market. You know, if I am a lender, what's my problem? Right? One is I could potentially not get back the money and lending to someone I don't know, right? So that's the problem I have to address and that's where my risk comes in. On the other hand, the risk could also be that, you know what, this person wants a loan, desperately wants a loan. And this person says he wants a loan of $10,000, spread over five years, has a seven figure salary, and you know, everything is good. And this person still has, you know, wants a loan. From a risk perspective, I say, hey, this person's not gonna default. And I could potentially lend this person a loan. And guess what, two months later, this person repays back the entire loan. Now I have to figure out like, who else should I lend this money to? Because I thought I'm going to be getting you know, 10% interest for the next five years, but I just got <coughs> back the entire amount back in two months. Right? So is there a prepayment penalty involved? And if prepayment penalty is not involved, you know, what is the risk am I taking to lend a loan to someone who is uh, potentially not my target market? Because if someone's not at all desperate, they may just repay the loan. They don't want the hassle of paying money over the next five years. So I may want to like potentially eliminate some of those outliers. You know, I may not want to lend uh, money to people who have made eight loan inquiries because those are the people who may be really desperate and I don't know, they may be looking for multiple forums, they may be going to prosper, they may be going to lending club, everywhere they're putting in the loan application. Uh, so that's kind of the perspective you want to think about when you're doing exploration on whether these are the folks that are going to be interested in lending that loan. And then you can also summarize the loans. So you could see in here, if I look at uh, the buckets for each of them in the histogram, it also kind of you know, plot a distribution cost. So you can see that uh, most people are kind of, you know, borrowing in this segment. And then some people have borrowed you know, $35,000, uh, but um, most people are in this segment. So there is a skew, obviously. So you can also look at like the summary of annual incomes. So you see that some people are earning really low amounts. Some people are earning more than $150,000. So this is where you can potentially, you know, put your business constraints, if you will. Now think about business constraints talk to the model. You could potentially say, you know, it's not the machine telling us, hey, guess what? Don't lend to someone who's earning two hundred thousand dollars and wants a thousand dollar loan. Or, you know, if someone's earning less than ten thousand dollars, don't lend to them. The machine is not telling you yet, but you can just eliminate those categories. Say, you know what? I don't feel comfortable lending to someone who's asking thirty-five thousand dollars loan who's earning less than ten thousand dollars a year. Right? So I could potentially eliminate those when I'm even training my uh, my algorithm. And then there are people with different loan purposes. So you could see that uh, the majority of them are using it for debt consolidation. In fact, how many of you have seen the Lending Club Loan Ad? <coughs> well, if you've seen the Lending Club Loan Ad on TV, that's basically their value proposition. You know, say, I didn't even know that you know, I could basically consolidate my loans. You know, I have three credit card loans and I consolidated them and just I got it on Lending Club for, and I'm repaying all of them and just having one loan. And then you can also look at the different states. Maybe there are regulatory restrictions. You, know, you may have regulatory restrictions saying, you know what, California is not some state I want to be in. So I want to eliminate California related data. Or you may just be in California. So I only need to factor in California related data. I don't want to look at any other data sets. So this gives you a perspective on do you even have enough data? You have the right kind of data. All the questions I was asking in the morning, right? So you have to factor that in to make sure that you are building a model with the right kinds of data sets. Okay. And then you can potentially look at some additional metrics and this nice tool will give you like a profile report. So each one of them will tell you what kind of variables you have, you know, any missing value analysis. For example, you know, in here, the delinquencies in the last two years, 90% of them are zeros, which is good, but, uh, you know, you could have things like you know, employment length. 3.6% of people haven't disclosed that. In the form, they, they just left it as blank. And you don't have data. 
whether I mean, the person may not even have a job or may have been employed for less than one month. So would you want to lend money to this person? Right? So in those cases, you may want to think about like cleaning it up or removing those records because you don't want the model to kind of learn things which you should be, you know, uh, which, is, which is potentially bad for your predictions. <coughs> and then you can look at other, other distributions of uh, you know, what you can potentially see in terms of uh, various data sets. So I told you about so the correlations. Um, so the point here is just a simple Jupyter notebook with simple, some simple matplotlib has helped us understand so much about this particular loan data set, right? Just had 10,000 rows, but now we have so much more clarity. We are kind of understanding the business problem. We are understanding why people are you know, borrowing money. Where are they coming from? What is their purpose? You know, what is the typical profile of a person who is borrowing money on lending club? Right? So now we have so much more information and we haven't done any machine learning yet. We're still understanding the data. Right? But we have a clear perspective now on what are we getting into when we're trying to build a model. Right? So that's like part one. Then, yes. uh, are these types of models uh, typically periodically updated yeah. based, based on recent experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's kind of the whole monitoring process because, you know, as the economy changes, people may get more desperate or may, you know, be taking more risky loans. You know, depending on how the economy is, you know, if uh, people think that the economy is doing great and they don't mind spending a lot, then they are taking a lot of risky loans. And they may be able to, they may be okay with paying higher interest rates. So you may have to kind of build models to track that evolution of risk. And that's how you are kind of looking at newer data sets. And you know what? The risk profile is increasing. The number of defaults are increasing. So what do we do in terms of our lending standards? And when people talk about tightening lending standards, that's what happens. You know, they're basically asking additional information or putting in breaks. You know, when they find that things may potentially go wrong. Okay, so that was like part one. The second part was, you know, kind of building upon the theme I talked about, you know, building different models, right? So here, what we're going to do is uh, try out a bunch of different models. So first we will, uh, you know, talk about exploration of data. We will just prepare the data and uh, uh, we, have, we, have, uh, we have converted some categorical data sets to numerical data sets. And uh, we've also done what's called as normalization. So <coughs> some algorithms want the data to be normalized already. So we have normalized some of the data sets. And uh, we have split this data into training and testing so that we're going to use 80% of the data for training and test it out on the rest of the 20% of the data. And uh, we have built some performance metrics. In this particular case, we have chosen mean absolute percentage error as our performance metric. And then we have built a function so that we can visualize some of these performance metrics. It also do some graphs. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before, this is what we are trying to minimize. I mean, it's root mean squared error, but we have put in the square root, but uh, mean squared error is what we were talking about. Okay, summation of errors is what we're trying to minimize. So this gives us a metric which tells us on an average how much am I going to be off. And uh, I could also do it in the context of mean absolute error, wherein I'm taking the absolute values of the errors and taking an average of it. Or the mean absolute percentage error, wherein I'm saying relative to the observation, how bad am I going to get. Right. And then in the context of machine learning models, you know, Invocation of models in Python is very simple. And that's the reason why I was talking about the multiplication of data set. Because people just take a data set, like it learn. There's something called as linear regression. It's pass in X and Y, and it's going to give you a bunch of factors. And that ends my video. If you like this video, like us. Right? So there is not much insight built into it. You know, you'll be thinking, oh, you know what? Machine learning is so simple. I can, I can even, I can use this. Like I don't require any knowledge, and if you have not engineered the problem, these models will never go into production. Yes, please. 
Why would you always want to use the mean absolute error if it's less influenced by the outliers? Uh, it depends on the business problem and depends on like, you know, I mean, like every industry has its own methodologies. I worked at, uh, for a consulting project and uh, they said, uh, everything we look at will be in the context of mean absolute percentage error. And that's the, that's the only thing we'll, we'll look at. Uh, mean absolute error, people may be thinking about on an average, am I going to, how much am I going to be off? Would you like to be okay with it? It's less influenced by the outliers then. It could be, but the question is like, if there are not much outliers and more or less everything is kind of, you know, somewhere in the middle, then you are trying to figure out like how much variation on either end, if it's a symmetric data set, it is always kind of hovering in the center of the potential views as I have mentioned. Um, so there are so many packages which you can potentially use, but here, just to give you a, an illustration, if we take a segment of the data, you know, the blues are the predicted values and the <coughs> oranges are the true values. So the best model we could come up with, minimizing the errors, you know, in certain cases, the blues and the oranges are very close. In certain cases, the blues and the oranges are way apart. So uh, we have built a model, but ideally we wanted to have all the blues and oranges converge for the best possible model. So uh, metrics wise, the best model we could come up with was 18.68% error. Okay. So the question is, can we do better? Um, so then we ran a random forest regressive model. So the random forest model, we talked about briefly the decision tree model. So the decision tree is one tree. If I do these recursive splits on different features and build an ensemble of all these trees, the ensemble of these trees is basically a forest. That's basically a random forest. Right? So if I use an ensemble model called as a random forest model, we can do something similar. And here, you may have to choose a bunch of hyperparameters. Things like, you know, uh, how many leaves do I want? What's the maximum depth of the tree? All those things are the hyperparameters a data scientist has to choose. And then if you run through the analysis, surprise, you're getting a mean absolute error percent of 5.85%. Regression gave us 18.68. Random forest gave us 5.85. Um, and then I could also potentially design a very simple neural network. And in the simple neural network, if I do my fit, and I do my prediction, I mean, we didn't do a lot of optimization in the hyperparameters. We just took a whole bunch of values and just write it up. And my mean absolute percentage error was 6.64%. Okay. So if I compare it then, this is kind of the table I'm getting. You know, overall, random forest beats linear regression and neural networks. However, <coughs> Neural networks is the least interpretable model of all because I don't know what these parameters are. How is it influencing the outcome? But new, you know, random uh, linear regression, I can look at the coefficients and understand the influence of each factor or each feature on the outcome. Very interpretable. So, and the random forest again, you know, it's an ensemble model, very difficult to interpret. So the point here is, depending on your business use case, you may choose a worse off algorithm because you want it to really have interpretability. And you may have to think about just tuning that particular model. Um, then comes the predicting the interest rates. You are, you are kind of uh, you know, using your test data and you're predicting it. And uh, you can save all these models. What we have done is we have used a format called as pickle so that we can pickle these files, which is basically dumping it into a binary format so that we can use that when we build out the final application. Okay. So here, uh, when I talked about exploration, we were just kind of um, understanding the data. And in the second notebook, we just basically built out a bunch of models. Now we have a clearer understanding of how we can potentially, you know, what is the amount of errors or uncertainty allowed to expect when I build out these models. Now we'll extend it further. So I made a random choice of some of these hyperparameters. Now the question is, can I tune these hyperparameters and will it do me any good, right? 
So the notion here is, um, we want to kind of go back to the slides in here. Um, there's this, the parameters are what we're expecting the model to learn, right? In the context of regression, give me the best coefficient. Give me the best uh, intercept. In the context of neural networks, I have to make certain choices. How many layers do I want? How many epochs do I want? How many nodes should I have in each one of these layers? What optimizer do I use? All those are hyperparameters I will have to choose. So the goal is, can I vary my combinations and figure out the best possible hyperparameter choice which will match my expected outcomes. So you have to think in the context of, well, how do I set that up? In um, crude ways, you could set it up as a grid. If I have three possibilities in one direction, three possibilities in another direction, I have nine potential combinations of hyperparameters. So I can run nine different experiments and choose the experiment which gives me the best possible result. Right? Yes. Yeah, you can you, you keep the same test set aside. Yeah. You just basically train <coughs> the data with different hyperparameter choices. Um you see what I'm saying is do you keep a final bit of data so you you can optimize like Right, right. So now we are kind of going beyond just training and testing. We have training, testing, and validation. So that's so where validation, right, right, use validation yeah, test the exactly. Yeah. So that's where you're, uh, yeah, you're right. So uh, one of the things you could potentially do, you know, that, as I said, there are a lot of uh, uh, things you have to think about in building our model. Uh, but uh, let me let me kind of uh, go back to what I was talking about in here. So. I would like to have an algorithm wherein I'm going to be exploring these aspects, but um, in the context of, let me show you some choices you could potentially have. So this is a neural network, so I can potentially design this neural network with number of layers. I could change the number of layers. I could basically have <coughs> different uh, inputs, and different outputs of, um, here in the hyperparameter choices, this is one setup. The only parameter I'm going to change is the learning rate. So depending on different learning rates, how will my model perform or the loss function perform, right? So just to give you an illustration, I chose different learning rates and everything else being the same, you know, you can see that for model zero, the loss is like 0.017, so 1.75. For the fifth model, the loss is 2.825. So the choice of the learning rate has different influences in terms of loss functions. And that's just because the number of epochs is still the constant. <coughs> so if I have a very small learning rate, uh, which is what we have in here, right? So this is what it was able to converge. So you could potentially look at this and say, you know what, I'm going to choose a particular learning rate. You know, this is the best it gave me and I can choose that particular learning rate for my algorithm. Um, and um, the other thing you could also potentially do is you could draw these plots to say that how will my model perform, you know, over time based on the number of iterations, right? So these are the different uh, uh, losses and for the various iterations. Um, and you could also look at like hyperparameter tuning in the context of optimization algorithm choices. So Anish was talking about SGD, stochastic gradient descent. There's another one called Adam, which is adaptive. And uh, the changes depends on um, individual nodes. The, the weights are not constantly, the errors are not constantly applied. There's an adaptive you know, error update for each of them, uh, in each one of the nodes. So this is another choice. So here you could see that uh, the Adam optimizer was actually better than the SGD optimizer for this particular hyperparameter. Okay. 
so that's another potential thing you could do. And then Anish was talking about regularization. So here we can add penalty as you know basically regularization as penalty as the model complexity increases. So there's L1 and L2 regularization. So you could potentially write that out for various alphas and you could figure out what the losses are going to be for different alphas. <coughs> so the point here being, uh, and we have tried some other parameters too. You know, one is activation functions. You know, we then um, you know, instead of using one parameter at a time, Python gives you what's called as a, a grid search. And you could use this grid search to look at different combinations. You can set it up saying, you know, try out different optimal activations, try out different solvers, try out different alphas, try out different iterations, try out different learning rates, and then tell me. So there are 72 potential combinations. And then once it uh, goes through all of them, it will basically, uh, uh, either there are 216 different combinations, I guess, and then you come up with the best possible model. And you tell me what the best possible model is. And then you can potentially export that model. So we can also do similar things for random forests. Um, you can choose the different depths of a tree. Based on the different depths of a tree, you're going to see different results. Okay. Uh, and we talked about linear optimal, linear regression too, right? So there you can potentially set up uh, different uh, hyperparameters, and you can say that. So the point I wanted to emphasize here is that when you're talking about building out algorithms, it's never a one-shot thing. So you'll have to try out an algorithm and then try out different hyperparameter choices to see which is the best possible model for that particular application. Okay. So I want to conclude with the latest range which everyone's talking about, and that's AutoML. Uh, there are a bunch of new frameworks which are helping us out in kind of getting beyond just putting this grid together and enumerating through this entire search space of grid parameters. Because if you just treat it, everything as a grid, then you have to try out all these parameters and then figure out what's the best possible choice. So a couple of different frameworks are in place. One is what's called as VECA. And uh, you know, this, this one, uh, uh, you know, it combines the VECA package, which is, uh, uh, package which was developed at I think the Waikato University in New Zealand. Um, there's another package called Auto SK Learn, and that kind of extends this Auto Waco functionality for Scikit Learn. Um, and then there's another one called Teapot, which is pretty cool because it uses genetic algorithms for figuring out the best hyperparameter choices. Uh, and these are all like open source again. You can try it out. And um, there are also a bunch of other packages. H2O, there's a company called H2O. They have H2O AutoML. This Google AutoML, you didn't want to do anything. Just upload it to Google and not worry about you know, what algorithm to choose. Google has a bunch of algorithms. You can try it out and give you a solution. Uh, MLR has, uh, is an R package. If you're an R person and you want to use R, there's a bunch of packages available out there. Uh, there's another package called AutoKeras if you wanted to do what's called as neural architecture search. If you're building out neural networks and you want to figure out the like, best architecture for neural networks, you can potentially use something called like AutoCaros. Uh, and obviously, you can scale all these up as hyperparameter uh, optimization is computationally expensive because you're running multiple combinations of the same experiment with different data. Uh, so definitely leverage GPUs and you know cloud uh, so that you can run your experiments faster. Um, I want to show you. Um, how it's going to look if you kind of try it out. Uh, so we have experimented with a couple of AutoML choices. So this is AutoML with Teapot, and this is just a picture from the website. Uh, so this is the raw data. You cleanse it. You do feature selection. You do model selection, parameter optimization, and then model validation. So this whole process is going to be automated by Teapot. And uh, you can you know, kind of go through the same process. And what it does for you is when you run through this, uh, it basically creates a Python file. It actually generates a Python file, an executable Python file, which has these parameters built into it. It'll try out different combinations and give you a Python file, a completely executable Python file, which you can just deploy. So that's kind of the beauty of using 
search engine. Um, and you can also look at like, you know, different parameters and figure out like what uh, values it has. Um, there's another one, this is like another auto ML package. This one we use H2O, you can run through the, the same thing and get a, you know, uh, it runs through a different set of algorithms and you can see the leaderboard and it is a stock ensemble, best of family. These are like the parameters, XGBoost, GLM, XGBoost grid. So based on different parameters, you can see the error metric, you choose the best possible algorithm you can potentially apply. And the third one is uh, using auto scale learn, I believe. Um, so that too, you can like, you know, run through different parameters. And uh, you know, once you run your auto ML, it will show different models and you know, summary of models based on the metric you have chosen. And you can look at the best possible model and then you know, get, get the lead for that. So you can compare the different models. So you know, this is Teapot, H2, and auto scale learn, some of the features in there. So you can see that in terms of mean absolute percentage error for training, you know, uh, Teapot had the lowest and then um, the MAPE was uh, highest for H2O, but for test data, H2O had the lowest MAPE. So, uh, you know, ideally we want to get the model which has the lowest MAPE for the test data. And uh, we can potentially get to a model. Um, so you can look at all the other parameters. So, you know, when we started the experiment, linear regression gave 18% MAPE. Neural network data, so it's all for the test data. Neural networks gave us like 5.68. Random forest carriers like around 5 point something. Teapot um, gave us close to five. Auto Escalon gave us close to five. H2O, based on their best model, gave us close to, uh, I think it was like 1.99%. So if you use this as a metric, MAPE as a metric for this particular problem, you know, you could potentially use H2O and uh, try out Yes, sir. The, um, when, when uh, the auto, and I'm going to bring it up. Were they using the validation test to determine which one they're going to keep? Uh, which one they're going to keep? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Mr. Prop, I'm just curious. The, the errors on the validation set, and the, and the, and the errors on the test set. Yeah. The validation set is. This is, uh, we're looking at only the training and the test. Okay, okay, so not a validation. Well, the training data, they take your part, the take part of it as validation in the training itself. Yeah. yeah. So, it's kind of interesting that the H2O and the test and the training is more or less the same. Yeah, that's true, right? Yeah. I mean, they're using some complex algorithms. You know, XGBoost and GLM and a bunch of others. So if we had given those algorithms for that, I mean, we haven't done much testing. We could have potentially given those choices for auto scale and other things to see. You know, people have gotten similar results. Yeah. Yeah. The other one thing is that it's slow on the training and then yeah. the test. Right. Yeah. And you do that's true. This is comparable. <coughs> These other ones make sense. These two definitely make sense. Okay. So I hope that gives you an idea on you know, what's involved in building our machine learning algorithms, right? Uh, when I started out in the morning telling about like, you know, different data science kinds of problems, I kind of gave you like, all the perspectives which you could potentially think about. But this gives you like a concrete example. on uh, if you have a lending club data set, how do you go from you know, ingesting the data to building out a model, trying out different combinations of models, optimizing your models, and then finally, just putting it into a pickle file, and then we built out a Flask application so that you can make it available to an end user so that they can go in and put in those choices and choose the best algorithm. We didn't put any of the AutoML algorithms in the final uh, deployed application, but we could potentially just do that. Right? Take this model parameters. Okay. okay, any questions? Okay, so it's kind of time to wrap up. Um, so, uh, the whole purpose of this workshop was to give you multiple facets of what it is in today's day and age to build data science applications, particularly finance. Okay. 
So as you can see, it's not just a very straightforward process. You have to kind of be comfortable with uncertainty and looking at different facets of problems and being able to engineer those problems. Okay. Um, so uh, the workshops in the next four months will help you prepare to get into that mode of thought process. So we're gonna have four workshops. Each workshop is gonna be two days. So you're gonna work through each concept. So it's gonna be a workshop on data science, workshop on optimization, workshop on econometrics, and the workshop on building machine learning applications. Okay. Each one of these workshops is gonna be two days. You're gonna go through the material. You're gonna build out exercises in the classroom. And you're gonna be given a class capstone project at the end. You'll have one month to complete the capstone project. You attend all the four workshops, you do all the four capstone projects, and finally there's gonna be a demo day slash presentation component, and you're gonna demonstrate your final project and you'll be eligible for certification. Okay, so um, I hope to see you back in the certification program, and we will announce the dates and more details about the workshops as we get some more clarification on logistics. But I hope you enjoy your workshop. And uh, thanks so much for spending time with us today. And I uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you.